this particular tour, the stars, the big star show of '62, would have had lots of people come and see that. There was a, there was a lot of money flying around. It looks like um, Larry. Oh, it was packed. Everywhere was packed. I mean, later on, we did the Beatles tour in, in '63, and um, they they said to me, because we all got quite friendly with his '60. 66 shows with them. We're with them all the time. And he said, oh, yeah, because we, we used to come to see you at the, Liverpool, the Empire. That's the big theatre in Liverpool. And uh, we used to, because they were just like a local band. And they said, we used to come to see you. And um, uh, we, we really liked your boots. <laughs> they didn't mention the music, but they said, we all had the sort of the high heel boots on. That you could only get an Anna and David. And he said, if we ever if we ever make any money, we always said we we're going to go to London and buy buy some, which became the Beatles boot. Oh, that tickled me. That tickled me that they were actually there, um, you know, watching it. It was a big. It was a big deal because they Billy had sort of the same, almost the same effect on the audience as, as the Beatles later on. It was still people screaming and and outside and having to run and getting cars and half the town out watching us sort of leave or him leave. Um, probably not quite as much as the Beatles still, but it was still pretty full on, you know. Of course, he was um, he was a Liverpool lad himself, wasn't he? Yeah, and he, he had a fantastic act. I mean, it was quite a sexy act and he was a great, great, great performer. And... Uh, so we spent quite a lot of time with him. So we've, then we finished up doing the season with him after this tour in Yarmouth. So it was, uh, it was, it was good. It yeah. was good. We, we were all sort of friends and it was fantastic. So you were with Larry Parnes, you were doing loads of stuff with him and then you you got a call up from from Brian Epstein and Arthur Howes for this for this Beatles one. Yeah. It was, is, cause how, we did how did that 60, happen? Well, it was weird because we did the 63 summer season in Yarmouth again, but in a different theatre with Helen Shapiro and um, Ronnie Corbett was on it. If, um, he said to me, who's the least likely person to make it in showbiz in it within him? He used to come on and die twice nightly. But then we were doing other gigs and then just sort of out of the blue, we had a, a new agent called Ozzy, Ozzy Newman and then he came out of the blue and said, oh, do you want to do the Beatles tour? Said, wow, it was amazing. And then we, we went... <laughs> We went down to see them. They were playing. They were just in the sort of Love Me Do kind of era. They were playing a sort of dingy dance hall called Leighton Baths in the East End. We went to see them. Said, oh, "Hello, you know, going to do the tour, blah blah blah." And then they said, um, "Well, you're the, you're the locals. We don't know anywhere in London. Can we go and eat somewhere?" So we went, "Yeah, we'll take you." So we went to this sort of golden egg type restaurant in Old Compton Street. Funny enough, nearly opposite the two eyes where it all started. And we just sat there, was all of them, us, Paul chatted up the waitresses, and, and it was like nobody had any inkling of what was going to happen. It was just another tour that was going to go great, you know, but it's not going to be bigger than the Billy Fury thing. And bang, it was when it all happened, it was quite amazing. That was basically, I mean, obviously it's before they went to America, but that was Beatlemania. You were at the epicentre of that. Yeah, we... we well, not only that, as part of our act, we had a sort of, bit of, a, of a corny part of it where we did sort of impressions of various people. We did a, a blackout, we did a big a drum roll, and now they, all the lights are off. Now, ladies and gentlemen, who have you all been waiting for? The Beatles. And we all put wiggers on, and the lights came up. So there was this incredible sound. I never heard anything like it, followed by the biggest, oh, God, it's just them. <laughs> I mean, we did experience that 66 times. It's something I'll never forget, you know. And funny enough, when we, we went, we decided to do this. We, went down, we couldn't have found a wig anyway. We went into um, Oxford Street to a um, big shop there, uh, Marks and Benson, I think it was, and bought ladies' wigs and trimmed them up to look like Beatles things. <laughs> it was, uh, it, but to experience that, that sound is. I can't tell you, it's incredible when they when they were announced. And I mean, obviously they thought they kind of walk straight on, you know. It was um, it was pretty amazing. Were they surprised about the about what had, what had happened to them so quickly? Well, I think they, you know, the famous story about them is they didn't really realise, so they went into a sweet shop somewhere and 
everybody dropped the sweets on the floor. Um, but then it, during the tour, it was getting harder and harder for them. They used to struggle to sort of get in. But then after the show, the second show, um, they had to go straight out. They used to finish with twist and shout, dun, 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 bum, bum, and they were gone straight in the car because what would happen is all that audience and their big theatres would come out. Half the first house would be there, so you couldn't get in and out. If you so we we were in there. Sometimes it would take us two or three hours to get out, loading all the stuff up, and then trying to get through the crowds. It was like unbelievable. Just un- the whole town would come out. It was when it started happening that Beatlemania thing it was like wow everybody had to still come down to the theatre um, it was incredible well, we got caught in it a couple of times and it's scary really scary I mean you know we all at that stage we all had Beatles it's just all haircuts and things and if you put your head outside the stage door you take taking your life in your hands it was pretty you know but um what happened was halfway through that tour, we did Bournemouth, and um, the ABC um, news people and the two or three of the American channels sent photographer, um, film crews down to show what was going on in England. I thought, well, that's strange, because th- at that stage, America was a different, completely different ball game. But that was obviously Epstein then getting it ready for them to go over there. It worked fantastic. We, we we went to we did Ireland we did uh, Belfast and Dublin on that tour with the, with the Beatles and it was amazing because we went to the airport you know all the pictures you see of all the kids up on the top well obviously Epstein organised all that so when he got on the plane there was all thousands of people there and then when we came back coming off the plane with them it was just crazy absolutely crazy. It was amazing, amazing. Did you witness the the Beatles sort of, um, you know, writing music during that, you know, backstage and no, things like that? You no. never saw that I mean, happen? We, what used to happen was they would come in early and there might have been, say, 100 policemen sitting in the audience ready to go out to sort of police around the theatre and generally, and then we'd nearly always have a sort of jam. So they, one or two of them, one or two of us, and we never recorded any of it. I've got some pictures where you can see... John with our pianist, I'm playing Ringo's drums, and then it was just a, trying to while away the time, really. I never saw them actually writing, but about halfway through, I obviously got on really well. We'd just sit and play cards with them all the time, and we were just there. And I thought, well, I'll, I'll ask Paul if he any ideas of what we should record because by then we'd had about seven or eight singles out which hadn't done the first one Can Can did well but after that it was not great so um, he said I'll tell you, I've got a song that would be good for you and it's not one of ours but we used to always do it in the cavern so he played he played me Hippie Hippie Shake and um, <laughs> oh, oh great okay well, and stupidly I did thought Oh, well, don't think much of that. We won't do that. <laughs> but a few weeks later, the Swingy Blue Jeans had a massive, massive hit with it. It was like crazy. And thinking back, why didn't we do it coming out of his mouth from him and him playing it for us? And he was like, but um, that was the story of our record thing. We just kept sort of missing missing it. Just talk us through the boys then, Ringo, George, Paul, John, what were they each like for you? Well, obviously, I got on well, uh, Ringo, all sort of drummers get on well, I, I'd actually already met him before, because he, 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 when he came to uh, um, one of the holiday camps near here with Roy Storm and the Hurricanes, we went to a party and he was there and we met him there. So, obviously got, got on well with him. George, at that stage, was very much the sort of boy, young Boys starting, and it seemed to be basically Paul mainly who was the sort of the leader who got on great, and he was just a fabulous guy, you know. He he's got it, you know, and he's still got it now. And then John was just starting to come a little bit more withdrawn. Um, even then, he was like, "Where's John? Oh, we, oh, he's upstairs reading a book." And um, 
you know, that's a bit odd for the early 60s. It was sort of a, wasn't the kind of thing that, um, then, then they were great. They were great. And then the actor was just fabulous, you know. First thing we heard about them when we were on this Larry Palms tour was there was a group in Liverpool that's doing quite well and um, they don't do foot movements like the shadows. We were, I remember sitting on the coach for about an hour. I was like, How can they be getting anywhere without doing... Everybody did foot movements in those days. If you didn't do foot movements, you weren't a proper group. And um, they said, oh, and that name, I said, the Beatles, I said, that is the corniest name I've ever heard. At this stage, we hadn't heard any of the music. But we were all kind of just getting labelled as beat groups, which we yet didn't really like, beat groups this period. And you think, I just actually sat there and thought, that's the worst name I've ever heard. <laughs> they won't get anywhere with a name like that. <laughs> How wrong can you do? Um, hippie, hippie, shake, we should have done it. We should have done it. should have done it, man. Oh, well, there you go. You yeah. Regrets, so I've had a few. Yeah, that's life, that's life, isn't it? It's yeah. Sort of, um, we had another one which we'd done, which was an old record called um, Do You Love Me? And none of us are singers, but we made it quite a good track of it. And then um, it went up right up. Somebody else had done it in Decca, and it went right up to the little head office. And um, eventually they picked the other group, who were the Tremolos, because they just had a hit with, um, I think it was um, Twist and Shout. And um, so we didn't get it. And that's, you know, Do You Love Me? Now I Can Dance. You know, they run it as a corny record, but. Yeah. And it didn't make it. And then <laughs> all that had about. 50,000 in our fan club at that stage. <laughs> Some of them took it on. They heard this story. They, they started going around and puncturing the Tremolo's tyres on their van when they were doing the gig. So I had to sort of say, no, 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 this, it's not, not their fault. It's not their fault. There's, there's, a, there's a probably better than us. And that, it's how it went on. We went to America, trying to find material. I found a, a, a great track. It was going to be a hit record somebody I'd never heard of, brought it back. Uh, we went in the studio, recorded it, and um, it was <laughs> the first record by the Supremes. It was uh, Where Do I Love Go? And theirs, by the time we got it out, theirs was number one and ours was gone. But it was, I was pleased with myself. I thought, well, at least that was a good pick. That, was, that obviously was going to work. But to be fair, you know, you rub shoulders with all of these people and you were you were wowing them with it. The show sounds amazing, man. Yeah. I wish I'd seen it. <laughs> well, what was happening was all the sort of pop magazines were like, we, we were going to be the next big thing. We were on the front cover of Pop Weekly where it says all the bands that they got for about over a year. The, the reception was amazing. But what happened was because we were always working, because we were always going down so well, um, we thought the records would come to us. You know, we didn't have to, but where we should have really, in hindsight, sort of said, right, we've now got to start writing or get some written stuff. Um, and then we changed because we got we we hadn't had a singer, and we found this singer Terry Reid. So like, we changed the band a lot from the sort of old Jay Walkers to more of a soul kind of band with this Terry Reid. And then we got the we did the Stones I Cantina tour in '66 with them, so that was sort of we changed the style. We weren't doing the Can Can anymore, and that. And then during that tour, we went to the Yardbirds with Jeff Beck and Jimmy Page at that stage. I Cantina, a uh, ten-piece band. The Stones did the whole second half, uh, fifteen shillings top. <laughs> it was amazing, and. Apparently, Jimmy Page said to Terry, who's an amazing singer, uh, just missed it by a fraction, um, I found a great drummer, and I'm going to start my own group. They didn't, neither of them liked being in the yard, because it was too poppy. And um, did you want to do it? He said, well, Terry said, no, I'm going to leave Peter, but he doesn't know yet, I'm going to go solo. He's an amazing singer. He said, but I've just seen this guy called Robert Plant, why didn't you ask him? <laughs> so it was like, wow. It's like you can't believe it now. It's like well, Terry would have been, you know, it may not have worked. It may not have worked. It's just um, 
it's almost like um, sliding doors moments, isn't it? You know, well, it is sliding doors. I was going to yeah. say it's the sliding doors. That's it is that. It's just sometimes the doors open and all you got to do is walk through it. You know, and um, it was just because it, it, it wasn't a proper business right in the start. There, it wasn't kind of like it is now. It's a proper business. Everybody's business like they all. I mean, most of those bands, those early bands, all got ripped off completely. I mean, you'd expect it was like with us. I mean, we had 100,000 sales with Decca, and when we were supposed to be getting something like a penny a record or something, whatever it was, um, right at the end, when we sat at the set, like, where's the royalties? He says, oh, no, well, actually, this is just for the studio time. This is for the ads that we took to promote the record. And so there's nothing there. And, you know, it, it, nearly all, everybody, I think Stones, the Beatles, everybody got ripped off to start with. Yeah. And it was only, to, if you could get over the first three or four years, you then became sort of, oh, where is all this money going? Where, why is Joe Meek always writing the B-side? Um, why are we paying for sheep music? I mean, it should take half the royalties for sheet music. I've just got a hold of a copy of Can Can 62, the sheet music. I mean, it's the most it's a complete rip-off because you signed away half your royalties. And the answer always was, oh, we have to publish this in sheet music. Well, have you ever heard Can Can 62? It's not the sort of thing you can play on the radio anyway. <laughs> so, and it was only the ones that survived long enough um, then understood, oh, where's all this money going? Where it, it, it also wasn't cool in those days to worry about money. It wasn't the kind of thing, you know, it wasn't being... Bit, we, the whole movement was really getting away from men in suits who were businessmen, boring business kind of thing. This was, this was a new thing happening. Mm. But it was still being controlled by men, men in suits at that stage. You know, it took a few years before the people started to make some money. You said that you were getting twenty pounds a week on the on the tour with with Billy uh, with Larry yeah. Pons. When you moved over to the Brian Epstein, did that go up a little bit, or did it stay the same? I don't remember it going up much, but the the main thing was that we we we, we were going. It was going really well, and uh, we got on really well with the boys. It's great, and then all of a sudden they they went from that tour to um, the Christmas show. They did every year for a few years and then after that they went to America and we we were we didn't get the Christmas show and so we didn't get the American tour because something Sounds Incorporated did the Christmas thing and and I found out a couple of years later that agent had actually said oh they've done really well can we get an extra £200 a week not each for the whole band and that is I think what blew the chances of doing the Christmas show and then possibly, probably, I would say, going to America and playing to Shea Stadium and, and all that, which would have you know, been amazing. And that's and all, that's all because, of the, because the agent had asked for a little bit more, wow. Just a little bit more. And I mean, yeah. we would have done it for the same. We would have practically done it for nothing, you know. Yeah. Um, but that's what I, I read into it. it was because we, we had to, it fitted really well. We closed the first half of the Beatles show. And they did the second album. It was it worked. It worked because we were completely different. We weren't singing. It was nearly all instrumentals and um, big drums. So it was strong, strong act to follow. Yeah. I was going to say to you, you didn't ask me, but basically, all these places when you were doing a tour like that, they, you can't remember one theatre from the next. You know what I mean? You, you you sort of remember the Albert Hall. I remember Liverpool Empire, basically because of, of the connection with them. And then all the others become a blur, except we, we did the Globe at Stockton, Stockton Globe, which just had millions spent on it. Um, that was, we rolled up there on the, on the Beatles tour, and apparently I had a radio on in my dressing room, obviously listening to see if our record was going to be played on Radio Luxembourg um, or something. And that was when Kennedy got shot that day and it was like everyone was saying what we gonna, it's a show going on a show not going on what's going to happen it was like bombshell and 
eventually they did the show. I think they've had a major riot if they hadn't done it. And uh, that's sort of obviously something like that sticks with you forever, you know. It's, um, it was, was we, everybody was kind of like, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Do we do it? Or do it? And it was like, I don't know, it was an unbelievable moment. 